open water. All contact with the mainland, gone. You have no idea where you are. It seemed like somebody threw a blanket over my airplane. I was actually seeing the fabric of time itself. The Bermuda Triangle. For hundreds of years, boats, airplanes, and ships have vanished in its diabolical geometry. Today, the mystery of the Bermuda Triangle continues to confound. It was right there on radar coming in for landing, and the whole plane's gone, everything. But is the Bermuda Triangle really a sea of despair? Home of rogue waves, a weather vortex, a mysterious electromagnetic force, or imagination run wild. Uh-oh, red alert. Basically, the Bermuda Triangle, the premise of the whole thing is false. You decide as we bring the Bermuda Triangle out from the murky depths and into the clear blue skies. It's another great day in the Atlantic Ocean. Blue sky, clear blue water. The perfect place to kick back, relax, and disappear for a few weeks. Or forever. This is the Bermuda Triangle. Within paradise lies a deadly force from which you may never escape. Or so they say. For centuries, that's apparently what's happened to hundreds who ventured here. Ships vanish without a trace. Planes are snatched from clear skies. No debris. No SOS. Vanished. That's the devilish geometry of the Bermuda Triangle. Its borders stretch some 500,000 square miles, from Florida to Puerto Rico to Bermuda encompassing some of the world's most dangerous waters and a treacherous ocean floor that drops from shallow blue waters into a dark trench miles below the surface. The rumors and theories behind the Triangle's strange disappearances are enough to float a battleship. Sailors and aviators have reported spooky goings-on here for hundreds of years. But it was the disappearance of five planes that put the Bermuda Triangle on the map. December 5, 1945, Fort Lauderdale Naval Air Station. A squadron of five TBM Avenger torpedo bombers prepared for a routine training mission known as Flight 19. Once you're a Navy pilot, you're supposed to be able to fly any place with a plotting board and a compass and a watch. Retired aviator David White was a flight instructor with Flight 19 team leader Charles Taylor that day. He was one of our senior instructors when he was transferred up to Fort Lauderdale. It was a clear day with calm seas. But halfway through the mission, Taylor reported they were in trouble. And he said, my compasses are out. Well, for a compass to go out, it does happen sometimes, but not very often. As flight controllers tried to talk the men home, their radio signals kept growing weaker. Soon, no one knew where the men of Flight 19 were headed. NSO, 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 how do you read me? Over. I receive you very weak. My transmission is getting weaker. Within hours, all five planes, carrying 14 men in all, Vanished. Duty officer came around, knocked on the door. He said, five of our planes are missing. And both of us said, how could this be? Rescue planes scoured the sea and sky. David White was in one of them. We searched diligently for, for several days, found nothing. And then it seemed the triangle worked its deadly magic once more. Radio check, can you read us? Amazingly, one of those rescue planes and its entire crew 
also disappeared. After five days, the search was abandoned. Six planes and 27 men vanished without a trace inside the Bermuda Triangle. It wasn't long before the rumors started flying. How could six airplanes disappear into thin air? One theory was that a strange electromagnetic force seized control of their navigation instruments. Others argued that the planes were engulfed in a strange and deadly electronic fog or abducted by aliens. And people started paying attention to all the other weird happenings here. John Quasar is one of those people. I'm not interested in tragedies and accidents. I am investigating the mysteries, those that went out and should not have vanished. Quasar has devoted 15 years to studying the mysteries of the Bermuda Triangle and Flight 19. His book covers just about every triangle theory, including UFOs, or USOs, the submerged kind. Seems there's a theory that some aliens prefer to travel by sea, cruising in weird underwater vessels. They look like the aerial version, no fins, no anything, just a disc or an oval shape going underwater. Okay, that's kind of out there. But there is one story that calls to mind these USOs, and it happened 40 years ago. It's one of the cornerstone cases of the Triangle. One December night in Miami, Dan Barak and Father Patrick Horgan headed out for a short pleasure cruise. Not long after, they struck something in the water. The boat lost power, so at 9 o'clock, Barack called the Coast Guard. Coast Guard, this is me on the yacht. As the story goes, Barack described exactly where the boat was disabled, down to a specific buoy marker. There should have been no immediate danger. The witchcraft was overstocked for safety. With plenty of life jackets and extra flotation devices built into the boat, the witchcraft was supposed to be unsinkable. All they had to do was wait. But when help arrived minutes later, the witchcraft was gone. No debris, no bodies, in just minutes. There is no explanation, that's why it's a mystery. They were just sitting there waiting in a boat that could not sink. It's one of the most baffling triangle disappearances Quasar has seen. But the grandest is the USS Cyclops. In 1918, this 19,000-ton Navy collier began its journey. She was an unusual ship, with tall, slim derricks to transport coal. The trip should have taken just days. But the Cyclops is about 90 years overdue. No SOS, no trace. The ship's disappearance was called the U.S. Navy's greatest mystery ever. The fate of the Cyclops, the witchcraft, and Flight 19 is indeed a mystery. But is there a common thread? A disappearance always seems to occur when there's something wrong atmospherically and radios are having trouble. Sounds reasonable, but how do we prove it if all the victims have vanished into thin air? Well, turns out there's at least one eyewitness who's lived to tell the tale. Carrie Trantham of Key West, Florida, had a terrifying run-in with the Triangle in 1995. I'm flying along the coastline of the Everglades, and I'm feeling very comfortable. Then all of a sudden, it seemed like somebody threw a blanket over my airplane, and I was in total darkness. Her cockpit lights started flashing, her compasses spinning. But she saw nothing outside her window except a thick black fog. My mind was clicking, okay, what do I do next? As a pilot, you're supposed to trust your instruments, but my instruments were so erratic, I, I, I couldn't trust them. All the while, a loud buzzing in her ears. I didn't know what was going on. It happened so fast, and, and you're just in a, 
a life-death situation where you just don't want, I didn't want to die. So I tried to get my wings level, not knowing whether I was upside down or right side up. Could some strange atmospheric phenomenon have been interfering with Carrie's flight? And what could it be? Later, Carrie will get back into a plane with us to try and figure out what happened that day. And we'll meet one man who claims he's discovered a strange effect that could be the answer to the Triangle's mysteries. The total understanding of the Hutchison effect, I think, would be a very major key in discovering what makes the Bermuda Triangle act like it does, unsolving its unique mysteries. He'll show us exactly what that key is. But first, where did the riddle of the triangle begin? The Bermuda Triangle has puzzled observers for years. But if we really want to learn its secrets, the first place to look is in the stars. If you look at a compass in Europe, it'll point to the trusty North Star. Centuries of sailors depended on it. But if you sail across the Atlantic to North America, you're in for a big surprise. Christopher Columbus sure was. He had a hard enough time convincing his crew they weren't going to sail off the edge of the Earth. And when he reached the Bermuda Triangle and his compass pointed six degrees away from the North Star, well, it was pretty spooky. But it wasn't just the compass. Weird lights appeared in the nighttime sky more than once. Stories of the strange phenomena Columbus saw circulated for hundreds of years. By the 1960s, the rumors took on a life of their own. Some people were convinced Columbus had encountered strange electromagnetic anomalies or portals into other dimensions making his compass go haywire. And the lights? Aliens. As the years went on, the Bermuda Triangle gathered its own set of mystics and believers. Psychic Edgar Cayce proclaimed he knew the answer. It was all down to the legendary lost continent of Atlantis, which he claimed had sunk thousands of years before in the Bermuda Triangle. But Casey said some of its power crystals remained alive. These death ray crystals fire at ships and planes from below, disintegrating them like an Xbox game from hell. Casey had his triangle vision in the 40s, just before the world learned about the tragedy of Flight 19. Ships and planes have been vanishing ever since. But it took us until the 70s to really take notice. That's when Charles Berlitz wrote a book that took the world by storm. Tales of mysterious disappearances made the book a runaway bestseller. And that was just the beginning. Soon, a wave of publicity and theories raged across the world. It turns out scientists were looking into the powers of the Triangle too, and thinking maybe the Bermuda Triangle isn't the only one out there. Naturalist Ivan Sanderson came up with the idea of what he called vile vortices. He said they were specific areas of ocean characterized by violent sea currents, radical temperature changes, and electromagnetic anomalies. Two of the most vile vortices were the Bermuda Triangle and exactly on the opposite side of the globe, a place called the Devil's Sea. Just off the coast of Japan, the Devil's Sea is another place supposedly plagued by strange disappearances. It got a lot of attention in the 1950s, when nine ships vanished in just a few years. Maybe there is something to these vile vortices. Sanderson suggested the vortices, in particular the Devil's Sea and the Bermuda Triangle, are marked by strange electromagnetic disruptions. Maybe vessels in the triangle trigger these anomalies, he said, if they locked into some frequency in the area. 
Or could there be something going on inside the Earth we can't yet explain, causing these oddities? If the Earth's own electromagnetic field is being tweaked, in certain locations you see the potential on any form of matter, and either one theoretically can say cause it to disappear, disintegrate it, or we don't know what else. But we may find a clue to what's happening in the Triangle's atmosphere from the story of amateur pilot Bruce Gernon. December 4, 1970. Gernon was flying near Bimini when he saw a very strange cloud outside his window. It had silky edges to it. I went ahead and started climbing up, and it happened to be directly in my flight path. He entered the cloud, and within minutes, his instruments went haywire. Miami Radio, I'm not sure of my position. I'm in some sort of a fog. Can you help me? The flight controllers couldn't see him on radar. He had to get out himself. Soon, he realized the fog was closing in on him. Gernon created this illustration to show a phenomenon almost impossible to fathom. He saw that his only escape was a strange U-shaped opening ahead. So we went ahead and dove down, and, and then I noticed that the tunnel was getting smaller. White lights flashed all around, but he wasn't in a thunderstorm. And the deeper I went in, the more intense these flashes became, and the more rapid they became. I had never seen lightning like this before. As Bruce passed through the tunnel, it constricted around his plane. And then all of a sudden, these strange lines formed all around the airplane, and they were like cracks. And I could see clear blue sky on the other side. And I call these lines timelines, because I believe I was actually seeing the fabric of time itself when these lines formed. Finally, he escaped the tunnel. Then he looked back. And then I watched the tunnel collapse and form like a slit and rotate now in a clockwise direction. But Gernon wasn't out of the clouds yet. Soon he realized he was still trapped. What he didn't know was that the most terrifying leg of his trip was yet to come. Thousands of feet above the Bermuda Triangle, pilot Bruce Gernon just escaped the weirdest cloud he'd ever seen. But he was in danger of being enveloped by what he now calls a strange electronic fog. It was at this point where the fog attached itself to my airplane. His navigational instruments were still going crazy. Miami radar, requesting radar identification. The flight controllers spotted him. They said he was near Miami. Negative, Miami radar. I've got to be at least 80 miles east of Miami. Then he saw land. Miami radar was right. He was back in Florida. Bruce believes the flight only took him 50 minutes, when it should have taken 80. That's 30 minutes he lost somewhere in the triangle. He believes if he'd been flying in the opposite direction, the time tunnel he escaped would have disintegrated his airplane and him. When I think back at it, uh, it was very close to, to ending my life. Bruce's story of the Bermuda Triangle's strange fog and flying through a time warp has rallied triangle believers around the globe. The fog is the result of an electromagnetic field or charge gripping the aircraft created by some uh, phenomena that is unique out there, whether the atmospherics, the humidity, the very presence of the ship or aircraft. Quasar tells us the enigma of the electronic fog may not be solved in the triangle itself, but thousands of miles north in Vancouver, British Columbia. In the makeshift lab of amateur physicist John Hutchison. He's gained plenty of notoriety for a radical discovery he claims he's made. Hutchison began experimenting with radio waves and high voltages in his apartment decades ago. In 1979, he claims he stumbled onto something remarkable a series of strange phenomena that believers have dubbed the Hutchison Effect. 
And it's all a matter of RF frequencies and electrostatic frequencies. When I start generating all these different wild mix of frequencies, things start to happen. Strange things like levitating objects and metals turning to jelly with no heat. And he does it all on ordinary household current. How could that be? It's um, actually kind of scary in some respects to a lot of people when they encounter it. Sometimes we lose our relationship to time and space and find ourselves kind of confused. Jan Quasar and many other Triangle believers think the Hutchison effect can tell us a lot about the Bermuda Triangle. We have Hutchison doing this in a lab. We now have allusions and reports to it, so I'm sure people will get more uh, open about it. Okay, what exactly are we talking about? Simply put, Hutchinson claims he has found a way to create an electronic fog here in his lab, similar to the fog pilot Bruce Gernon experienced in the Triangle. Hutchison claims the electronic fog actually surrounds metallic objects and wreaks havoc with electronic equipment in his lab. But the fog is finicky. It doesn't show up each time Hutchison summons it. Even more challenging, Hutchison never takes notes. He relies a lot on intuition in conjuring the effect. Not surprisingly, more than a few skeptics are skeptical, including Georgetown University physicist James Mattingly. I don't know what the effect is supposed to be. It's as though anything that happens in John Hutchison's house is the Hutchison effect. And I don't know if this includes John Hutchison walking across the room. Is that a Hutchison effect? I just don't know. Hutchison is used to critics, but he claims to have proof. He's managed to capture the effect on video. And luckily we have four, about four instances of it um, happening with camera equipment when we're doing experimental testing. Well, if he can do it, so can we. Hutchison has agreed to let us film a live demonstration. All right, folks. I don't know what's going to happen once I turn this unit on. When I get into the transceivers and that and the other equipment, then it's... There could be a major effect happening there. If what he says is true, we're about to become engulfed in an electronic fog. Inside this alcove, hundreds of pounds of equipment and a foil-lined plastic jar are suspended by chains. Hutchison says the voltage here is unsafe for humans, so the camera crew has to stay back. I was in the back room. What's going on back there, Owen? Nothing yet. I'm hoping that we'll get the electronic fog and any other strange, goofy things that happen there too be great. Any glowing going on in there? Could there be? Okay, stepping up energy. Although the chains slightly vibrate, the camera can't pick up any strange effects. So Hutchison turns things up a notch. Go all the way, I might add a few extra volts. That sounds healthier, yeah. Well, how are you doing? Oops, you're doing fine, okay. Then, the experiment goes up in flames. I sent something wrong there. Uh-oh, red alert. A fire in the plastic jar. Fire means, show's over. But that doesn't mean the effect doesn't exist. It could just be hard to witness. That's not an argument that convinces Dr. Mattingly. The one thing that's entirely missing from all of this is any kind of sense of context. There's just no way to know what's supposed to be going on, much less evaluate whether it is going on, and then to try to evaluate what the exact thing is that is underlying this effect. But how about Hutchison's own videos? Two full hours of the Hutchison effect. Jellified metal, levitating objects, electronic fog. It is weird, and the fog does have its witnesses in the Bermuda Triangle. People would be hesitant to report the electronic fog because it's unproven. 
and it has happened far more than we wish to admit because there's about, since 1945, probably about 200 aircraft that have vanished. If the only real evidence is the video, maybe the best thing to do is to analyze that. Easy to duplicate again by... Tom Flynn and Joe Nickel are skeptical investigators at the Committee for the Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal. You could make something like this out of rubber tubing. They're not so sure about Hutchison's video. We don't know who made it. We don't know under what conditions. The video itself may be totally ungimmicked, but be a photograph of something fake. Later, Joe and Tom will try their best to duplicate the effects seen on Hutchison's video in their own makeshift lab. But first, it's easy for a skeptic to discredit the fog. But it's not so easy to shoot Hutchison's electronic fog down if you've flown through it twice. Well, the way he explains it, it's like a mist, and it sounds very similar to this fog that I was in. It's kind of like looking at a black and white television set when it's out of focus. Remember Bruce Gernon and his tale of getting trapped in the Triangle Strange Fog? Well, it happened to him again, years later, when he and his wife were flying over the Florida Keys. And we were heading north over the Everglades, and when we got over the Everglades, right on the edge of the Everglades, instantly it appeared as if there was fog everywhere over Florida. But not a regular fog. Bruce claims it was an electronic fog that attached itself to his plane. So I called up the Miami radio, and the weather bureau told me that there's no fog reported anywhere in Florida. It followed Bruce wherever he flew. So I had a feeling that if I headed toward the ocean, maybe I could get away from this fog. And it worked. Could some people possess special powers that actually draw the electronic fog to them? Now, for me to answer the question, it gets kind of personal. You know, it's almost like religion, uh, religious thoughts. But, you know, I'd rather not get into them. For some reason, whenever we go flying, we always see strange things. I'm almost thinking, I, I don't know, it must be our airplane. For Bruce Gernon, his repeated triangle experiences in the fog have taken on a quasi-supernatural significance. But is there a simple explanation for all this? There is one way to put it to the test. We've asked another triangle survivor, pilot Carrie Trantham, to go back into the triangle. She's agreed to relive her ordeal, this time with an experienced co-pilot at her side. Hopefully, we'll be able to cut through the fog once and for all. In 1995, Carrie Trantham was flying inside the Bermuda Triangle to the Florida Keys when she had the sensation of someone throwing a blanket over her plane. All her instruments went haywire. In an instant, she nearly lost control of the plane. It happened so fast, and, and you're just in a a life-death situation. I didn't want to die. More than 10 years later, Carrie has no idea what hit her that day. But she's finally ready to find out. We've asked flight instructor Carol Collins to fly with Carrie and simulate her flight to try and get to the bottom of what happened to Carrie that day. All right, 700 feet. I'm going to start my turnout. They'll do it at night, the same time Carrie took her traumatic flight. What was your ammeter showing? Do you recall? You know what? I didn't even look at my amp. I don't even think I... You know, I was just so panicked. You know? Right. I was, I was very panicked. Very scared. Panic scrambles your thinking. But what about the sensation that made Carrie panic? She said it was like someone threw a blanket over her plane. Well, Carol has an answer to that. When you are looking at a line of lights on the horizon and you fly near or underneath a cloud, those lights can suddenly disappear. 
and the horizon is now gone. And the sensation of having a blanket thrown over you is an interesting and probably very accurate description of how that feels. You cannot see the outline of the clouds at night. They just don't show up. That could be a possibility that I flew into a cloud. Once inside the dark cloud, total confusion. Loss of control is most often attributed to spatial disorientation. It boils down to a pilot's confusion over whether or not they're upright, turning, or even upside down because of conflicting information to the senses. Finally, a storm was following close on Carrie's heels. We kind of thought that maybe I was hit by lightning. It caused some of the instruments to be so erratic. Carol believes Carrie was trapped in bad weather in an anxious state over ominous waters. One of the big things about flying in the Bermuda Triangle is the fact that you are over open water without any other references. And it is a confusing place to be. How she responded in that state of mind and in that environment had everything to do with her experience. But if a psychological fog can be misinterpreted as an electronic fog, what can be made of the work of John Hutchison? He claims he can make the triangle's electronic fog at home. But since Hutchison almost never reproduces his Hutchison effect on command, he's got video as proof. In the video, bottles levitate, metal jellifies, and of course, electronic fog forms spontaneously. Triangle believers say Hutchison's strange effects are pure triangle evidence. But is the evidence real? Skeptics Tom Flynn and Joe Nickel think not. Now here's the, the seven up bottle clip. And they think they know just how it's done. Okay, and off it goes. It's so peculiar, so unlike what a human cameraman would normally do, that this bottle goes flying away and the camera doesn't want to follow it. So the assumption is that it, uh, it couldn't follow it. There might have been something up there that you wouldn't want to see. Their guess? Someone pulling strings. But Hutchison claims his experiments come with no strings attached. At least bust their guts laughing because how are you going to use strings in, in a full scale um, levitation experiment when you have uh, television people around and scientists who do controlled experiments. And but Nickel and Flynn think they can prove it. The Hutchison video was shot in what appears to be a garage or a basement workroom. It's got a beige concrete floor and there's stains and cracks and it's kind of variegated. Uh, and the nice thing about that, if you're doing something with filament line, is that that kind of background is very easy to lose the line against. I've rigged this bottle so that I have a control. Uh, it's fastened at the bottom and it's fastened at the top with filament. And this is going to be what we call the puppet effect. Here you can probably see the fish line against my solid color trousers. And yet, if I step away quickly, the line vanishes. Whenever you're ready, Joe, let's start the wobbling. Okay, stand by to fly it. Nickel and Flynn have imitated Hutchison's jumping soda bottle with a simple magic trick. But can they imitate an electronic fog? So now we're going to show how to create an electronic fog effect, as we think it might be done. What we've done first is to replicate the background light effect, which, as we can see from the uh, original footage, looks round and colorful and with a little highlight in the middle, much like a regular light bulb. So we put a regular colored light bulb on a uh, little holder rig, and we're going to create the uh, semi-metallic fog with some expanded metal it's actually a scrubber like you'd use in your kitchen and we're moving it rapidly very close to the lens which keeps it out of focus and we're blowing a lot of light into it so we get some nice highlights onto it and so we get this effect of a partly lighted partly opaque 
unknown substance in front of the lens and it acts very, very much like the electronic fog. We've now seen one way to create the Hutchison effect. And for Nickel and Flynn, the simplest answer is usually the most likely. Nothing Mr. Hutchison has done is proof of anything. Uh, he's offered no proof. And he needs to demonstrate his effect in front of really credible scientists and under controlled conditions that rule out trickery. But could this weird electronic fog be scrambling our compasses and leading us away from the real answer? Could there be another phenomenon, powerful but entirely natural, at the heart of the Bermuda Triangle? Perhaps it's time to turn to mainstream science and apply a bit of common sense to the cases of the Cyclops, Flight 19, and the Witchcraft. All three stories are tragic, but the case of the Witchcraft is particularly confounding. After heading out for a pleasure trip to see the Miami City Lights, the boat hit something strange in the water. and disappeared just minutes after a calm call for help. Closer examination shows the mystery of the witchcraft isn't such a mystery after all. Truth is, no one knew where the witchcraft was and the weather was anything but calm. Author Larry Cush dug up the facts of the witchcraft's demise years ago. So they were not at an exact position the way they said they were, which if they had been there, then, then it would be more mysterious than it really was. Nothing was ever found, and uh, it was stormy that night. They were talking about the uh, frothy waves out there, and they couldn't see in the dark. But the Coast Guard arrived only 19 minutes after the witchcraft's SOS. How could the boat have completely vanished so fast? No trace was ever found from a boat that was supposedly unsinkable. My comment to that is, so is the Titanic. Any boat can sink, any airplane can sink. The theory of a UFO or USO abduction is of course intriguing, but let's keep one important fact in mind. Even under the best conditions, it's tough to find anyone lost at sea. Jim No is a Coast Guard search and rescue expert in Miami. He's been doing it for 13 years. A lot of the uh, area uh, encompassed by the Bermuda Triangle is uh, open ocean. It's hundreds of miles from uh, the nearest land or communications facility. Um, so it would be very possible to not know the precise location that a vessel or a, or a, uh, a boat or an aircraft went down in. Add to that the violent effect of the Gulf Stream, that fast and powerful current that sweeps up from the Caribbean and into the North Atlantic. Oceanographer Arthur Mariano has been studying the Gulf Stream and the Bermuda Triangle for years. He says the Gulf Stream can make ships and planes disappear without a trace due to something called turbulent dispersion. When a ship or plane goes down, strong winds and currents pummel the vessel and scatter it for miles, sometimes within just minutes. Mariano can show us exactly how it works with a wave tank and some green dye. Okay, what we're gonna do next is inject some dye into the water. When we don't have any winds, we don't have any waves, we don't have any strong currents, over time the dye pretty much stays together. But with the current just a bit stronger, the dye moves fast. Brian is going to turn up the wind to generate more fully developed seas. As the waves uh, increase more and more, the dispersion will increase. What can all this tell us about the triangle? The combination of the strong waves, strong winds, strong currents, strong eddy activity all lead to very great rates of dispersion in the Bermuda Triangle area. So once you get lost in the Bermuda Triangle, if you're not found in the first few hours, it becomes extremely difficult for somebody to find you. Dye is one thing. Can it compare to a down seven-ton plane? 
That die is passive. It is just a marker for us to get an indication of the water motion. Well, when debris goes down in the ocean, it too is passive. It's going to be moved by the currents, by the wind, and by the waves. It seems the enigma of disappearing debris isn't quite so enigmatic. But we have yet to solve the bigger riddle. What on earth could have caused all these wrecks to begin with? It's tempting to blame disappearances in the Bermuda Triangle on the usual paranormal suspects, like electronic fog or aliens. The truth is, weather is a far more likely culprit. Bermuda Triangle has a, a collision or convergence of several different types of weather and, and oceanographic uh, type situations. We have the jet stream coming in from the north, we have the trade winds coming in from the south, and then on the western border we have the Gulf Stream, which is in the water itself. The weather here, even leaving out the challenges of the currents and the winds, is more than a little erratic. The Gulf Stream itself can actually create its own weather. It has that particular type of potential. There's a lot happening in the Bermuda Triangle that no one ever hears about. But stuff like water spouts, uh, white squalls, uh, other types of small scale phenomena that may only occur over a short distance, maybe a couple hundred yards, are never going to be actually seen by anybody uh, or forecasted by anybody. They just kind of pop up all of a sudden and they disappear. And so if you're not right there in the vicinity, you may never know that they occurred. A water spout can smash a ship or even a plane to smithereens. Hundreds are reported around here each year. Who knows how many are never reported? And then there's the rogue wave. These fast moving, 10 story high walls of water seem to come out of nowhere, terrorizing even the biggest ships. They're so huge, few believe the stories could be real. But they are. Up until recently, Observations of rogue waves were from people at sea. In some cases, these rogue waves were observed by very seasoned captains on U.S. naval ships, and they have reported rogue waves over 100 feet and high. Undersea quakes often get the blame for tidal waves, but on high seas, rogue waves pack more punch with less drama. A strong, relentless wind and a rough, open ocean may be all it takes to lift these troubled waters to dangerous heights. The Bermuda Triangle has all those ingredients, and one more. Well, in the Bermuda Triangle, with the amount of shipping traffic they have there, there's a much greater probability that a rogue wave, sooner or later, may influence a ship, and in some cases, turn the ship over. But a rogue wave surely had nothing to do with the fate of Flight 19, when 14 men flew into oblivion. The men of Flight 19 were experienced pilots. You'd think they'd be able to accomplish a simple training exercise. But the truth is, the team's leader was a novice on this particular flight route. This was Taylor's second flight out of Fort Lauderdale, prop probably his first flight out toward the Bahamas. When they started the flight, the weather off Florida was declared favorable. The sea, moderate to rough. An hour into his flight, Taylor reported he was lost. Over land, but it's broken. I'm sure I'm over the keys, but I don't know how far down. And his compasses, malfunctioning. Although the team was in the triangle, somewhere east of Fort Lauderdale when Taylor called for help, he thought they were far south, in the Florida Keys. It doesn't add up. Larry Cush thinks Taylor was just confused, and he didn't trust his compasses. And this is real typical when a person becomes lost or confused, and then their compass disagrees with what they see, they say their compass has failed. But what about the four other pilots? Were they lost and confused? Or did everyone's compass fail? How could this flight be lost in the Bahamas and not see any landmark unless they were just flying in circles, which means all of their compasses had to be haywire? But radio logs prove 
At least one of Taylor's students knew which way to go. Damn it! We just fly west, we can get home. The team was frustrated, but they followed their leader. And then, according to Kush's research, a change in the weather for the worse. Pretty soon they were out there in the dark. A storm came in, the ocean got rough. But they stuck it out. And they just eventually had to run out of gas. And they apparently tried to ditch before they ran out of gas. They also ran out of luck. I think the storm had come through and the waves were big and I think that the planes landed and broke up almost immediately. In the end, the tragic events of Flight 19 probably boiled down to human error and bad weather. But there's even more mystery surrounding the flight. Soon after the squadron disappeared, the search started in earnest. When the uh, control tower realized that the planes were really missing, they called all of the uh, airports and towers and everything up down the east coast, alerting them that our planes were missing. One search plane, a Martin Mariner, carried 13 men. It too vanished. What was going on in the triangle that night? How could six planes simply disappear within 24 hours? In the case of the Martin Mariner, the answer is probably simple. That plane was often dubbed a flying gas tank. They reeked of gas fumes, spontaneous explosions, not unheard of. In fact, the crew of a freighter ship saw a big explosion in the sky shortly after the Mariner took off. Eventually, telltale oil slicks and debris proved the Martin Mariner did explode. So the evidence shows there may be an answer to the case of Flight 19. But what about the case of Christopher Columbus? His compass seemed to go a little haywire when he hit the Bermuda Triangle too. But there is a simple answer. You see, no compass really points to true north. They all point to magnetic north, which is constantly moving. And since magnetic north is many miles from true north, compass readings change as you travel around the globe. All navigators now know how to compensate for this. In Columbus's day, no one knew. And with that, another triangle myth goes down the drain. But it's not so easy to explain the fate of the Cyclops. This 500-foot-long ship seemed to vanish into thin air in 1918. After her disappearance, President Woodrow Wilson declared only God and the sea know where the great ship has gone. But the Cyclops is far from a cold case. She carried a heavy load, more than 10,000 pounds. Some said the Cyclops was extremely prone to rolling in waves. A heavy storm could easily shift her cargo to one side, tipping her over. Problem is, there weren't any storms. At least not where everyone thought she was, deep within the Bermuda Triangle. But could she have been somewhere else? In 1968, a Navy diver named Dean Hawes discovered a large, peculiar vessel 70 miles east of Norfolk, Virginia. And he came upon this strange-looking ship with these huge derricks above them. It was strange enough to entice Hawes into exploring further, but he ran out of air and was forced to surface before he could fully investigate. He never forgot that ship. Years later, he saw a photo of the Cyclops and he knew it was the same ship. Funny thing is, the ship Hawes saw wasn't far from the Cyclops' final destination. When he heard about the possible discovery, Cush started calculating. He figured it would take about six days for the Cyclops to get there. She left Barbados March 4 and could have reached the wreck site on March 10. Well, I did some searching of the weather records. I found that there had been a big storm at the time that affected a lot of the eastern coast. There were some ships out there that suffered some big damage. Bad weather again. 
A few years later, Navy divers tried to locate the wreck Hawes described, but they never found it. So it seems the answer to the disappearance of the Cyclops leads us only deeper into mystery. We may never know for certain what happened to the Cyclops, the witchcraft, and Flight 19. But if we're trying to solve the mystery, there's one more sobering fact to consider. The truth is, statistically speaking, the Bermuda Triangle is no more dangerous than any other ocean route in the way of big weather. Bad weather is only a problem if you're in it. And there's bad weather all over the place. However, because of the number of ships out here and the number of planes, the odds increase that sooner or later, the probability of, of a ship or plane being in an area with bad weather increases. But just because we can explain most of the disappearances in the Bermuda Triangle, the case may not be closed. What's going on in the Bermuda Triangle is a phenomenon that's been going on for centuries. And it has the ability to affect time and space, which makes it so hard to understand. I think the mystery of the Bermuda Triangle to a lot of people just automatically means there's something strange going on out there. And they overlook what's right in front of their face, which is the ocean is a huge place. It's very rough out there. As long as people keep vanishing in the triangle, the myth will keep growing. The motivation to explain something like Bermuda Triangle is, is well, well intentioned. We all want to find causes for tragedies, but we need to not be following false, fantastic trails that will lead us nowhere. It's time for you to decide. Could there be a sinister force wreaking havoc within the triangle's borders? Or can we trust basic scientific conclusions and just say, blame it on the weather?